Welcome back to First Year Microeconomics. In this presentation, we're going to start the topic of welfare economics. This topic is going to take a fair bit of the next few weeks, so it's important to start with the basics. And in this presentation, we're going to outline the assumptions that we're going to add to our perfectly competitive model to start using welfare economics. Let's start by just reminding ourselves of the assumptions we've used so far. First off, for the perfectly competitive market model, we assumed homogenous goods, whether they were apples, gym memberships, whatever. One well-defined product. Second, we assume that the price buyers pay is the price sellers receive, or better to say, we actually used to assume that. We don't assume that anymore. Remember, we got rid of that when we started looking at a sales tax. So that's not actually an assumption we need. Our third and fourth assumptions are our price-taking assumptions. Given the price, buyers decide how much they would like to buy. Given the price, sellers decide how much they would like to sell. They lead on to our dynamic assumptions. If the amount that buyers would like to buy is more than the amount sellers would like to sell at a specific price, then we have excess demand and the price will rise. If at a given price, the amount sellers wish to sell exceeds the amount buyers wish to buy, we have excess supply and the price falls. Finally, we have our helpful assumptions. Demand slopes down, supply slopes up, but as we've seen, they're not necessary, they're just convenient. Let's start looking at our assumptions that we explicitly need for welfare economics. We're going to build welfare economics on our perfectly competitive market model, so our first six assumptions still hold. However, we've got an assumption seven, and that's pretty straightforward. We can measure the gains from trade by looking at the benefit to buyers, the benefit to sellers, plus any government revenue or less any government payments, and plus any benefits or less any costs to anyone else. Now that's pretty inclusive. Anybody affected by a market transaction is included in our measure of gains or losses from trade. Our next assumption is that buyers have well-behaved preferences. What do we mean by that? You'll find out a lot more about this in later courses, but let me give you a bit of a feel for it now. Suppose I'm going to give you the option of choosing one piece of fruit. I'm going to give you three choices, and you get to choose one. And I tell you, ah, your choices are banana, apple, or peach. And let's say out of those three, you say, yeah, you know what, I'll choose the banana. You go to grab the banana off me and I say, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. I've already given the peach away, I, I shouldn't have offered it to you. You say, oh, uh, I wasn't going to choose the peach, I was going to choose the banana. No, 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 hang on, hang on, I, I'm going to make you a different offer. Your offer is you can choose the apple, the banana, or a pear, not a peach. So choices between apple, banana, or pear. Now, in that situation, what would a consistent choice be? Remember, when you thought the offer was apple, peach, and banana, you chose the banana. Your actual choice is between apple, pear, and banana. What can you choose? In the first set, you chose banana, but now you might say, hey, I'll grab the pear. I love pears. Oh, I'm really glad you told me I could have a pear. That's a consistent choice. Or you could say, well, when the apple, peach, and banana were available, I chose the banana. Apple, pear, banana, I still choose the banana. That's also a consistent choice. What would be an inconsistent choice? Well, when the apple, peach, and banana were available, you chose the banana you showed you preferred the banana to either an apple or a peach. Now, when a banana, an apple and a pear is available, you've already shown that you prefer the banana to the apple. But if you suddenly now said, oh, I'll have the apple, please, that would be an inconsistent choice. Now, you learn lots more about this later on, so don't worry too much if that went a bit fast. It's called the weak axiom of revealed preference, so a long name, but it's actually a very simple idea. You'll see more in later courses. For the moment, 
Just think of it that we're saying buyers have to have consistent choices. Assumption 9 really just follows on from our assumption that buyers have well-behaved preferences. That is, we can measure a buyer's dollar value of a unit of a good or service by compensation principles. What do we mean by that? Well, let's say that you chose the banana, and I was about to give it to you. I drop the banana on the ground, jump up and down on it, squish it, and say, Oh, sorry about that. I haven't got another banana to give you. I, I want to make you as well off as if you did get the banana. How much money do I have to give you? And you say, look, give me two bucks. And that will just make me indifferent between having that banana and having the two dollars. Well, that two dollars is an amount of compensation for the banana. It's the amount of compensation that exactly compensates for you for the banana. So you're no better off with the two dollars or with the banana, you're no worse off. It exactly compensates you. That's what we mean by a compensation principle. In welfare economics, we're going to be bringing goods into dollar terms. So the two dollars is going to be the welfare economics value of the banana. That's important because when we start looking at markets, we're going to be looking at bananas or pizzas or gym memberships going to different people. And we need some way to add up the benefits of different goods to different people. And we can't do that by adding, say, apples and oranges. We need a common unit. And that unit is going to be the dollar's value of the relevant goods to individuals. Our next assumption is the assumption of profit maximisation. That's the assumption that sellers choose their decisions to maximise their profits. Now, that sort of seems to be pretty obvious, but actually there's a whole literature in management and in corporate finance that looks at whether firms really do maximise profits. For example, does a big firm maximise profits in the interests of its shareholders, or is it really run by the managers who do things that benefit the managers? whole debate about that, whole literature and finance and economics and management about that, we're not going to get into it. We're going to make the simplifying assumption that sellers, that businesses that sell things, maximise their profits. Assumption 11 just comes out of our profit maximisation assumption, and that is that we can measure the seller's gain from selling goods or services, so the seller's gain from participating in the market. We can measure that by the level of profits in dollar terms. So with assumption 9, we can measure the benefit to a buyer from trade in dollar terms. With assumption 11, we can measure the benefit to sellers from trade in dollar terms. But we do need one more assumption, and that is our assumption 12, which is a dollar is a dollar, or in other words, we have buyer benefits in dollar terms, we have seller benefits in dollar terms, and we can add them up. We can add a benefit of a dollar to a seller, plus, say, a benefit of two dollars to a buyer, and say that the overall benefit is three dollars. A dollar is a dollar, whether it goes to a buyer, whether it goes to a seller, it doesn't matter which buyer it goes to, it doesn't matter which seller it goes to. That's our assumption 12. Finally, remember that we have to test our assumptions against reality. Well, we've mentioned some of the issues with the assumption so far. So, for example, our assumption on buyer preferences, that's pretty controversial. There's a whole literature out there, not just in economics, but in management and in psychology, looking at whether buyers actually make consistent decisions. In fact, most of the marketing discipline is about how you change buyers' decisions. Similarly, if you look on the supply side and you look at the assumption of profit maximisation, as we mentioned, that's really controversial. But for my money, the most problematic assumption is the dollar is a dollar assumption. Let me explain why. What the assumption actually says is, if you have a rich person standing next to a poor person, and you take a dollar from the poor person's pocket and give it to the rich person, under the dollar is dollar assumption, 
there's been no change in welfare. I suspect most people watching this, and indeed most economists, would say, no, 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 that, we don't like that. We would prefer to have a dollar going from the wealthy person to the poor person. We would prefer to have some redistribution going on. If that's the case, why do economists use the dollar as a dollar assumption? Well, the reason's quite simple. Welfare economics is applied to a whole range of policies. And what most economists agree is that redistributive policies, policies, for example, that transfer wealth from the richest parts of society to people who are poorer, things like welfare safety nets, unemployment benefits, disability pensions, and so on, they need explicit redistributive policies. What economists get worried about is when redistribution is hidden in other policies that, quite frankly, don't seem to have anything to do with redistribution. So, for example, if you start putting redistributive policies as part of subsidies for gym memberships or part of an agricultural support scheme, that doesn't seem to be a very good way of running the government. So, most economists use the dollar is a dollar assumption for welfare economics when they're looking at policies that aren't about redistribution. And that's pretty sensible. It's not that economists are against redistribution. I suspect the vast majority of economists believe that some form of redistribution from the wealthiest parts of society to poorer parts is a good thing. The dollar is a dollar assumption is used to analyse those policies which are not about redistribution. And it's important to keep that in mind. Thanks for listening.